Is Russia willing to sacrifice an entire regiment of its most elite troops just to try to stall a Ukrainian victory? The answer increasingly seems to be yes. For months, the Ukrainian offensive has moved at a slow but steady pace. The expected breakthrough that many in Ukraine and amongst its allies have hoped for never seemed to materialize, and the world feared that Ukraine would turn into a grinding battle of attrition which Russia was much more suited to win. But all that could be about to turn on its head. To get to the recent breakthroughs, though, it's important to understand how we got here. During the winter months, Ukraine was largely forced to sit and watch as Russian forces built the most elaborate fortifications since World War I. Without large amounts of protected mobility in the form of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, precision weapons, and air defenses, the Ukrainian army was forced to cool its heels after its stunning fall counteroffensive victories. This was exactly the breather that Russia desperately needed. As winter snows began to blanket the country and make offensive action difficult, the Russian military was in a state of near catastrophe. The most elite unit, the 1st Guards Tank Army, featuring its best trained and best equipped men, suffered two humiliating defeats, with the second nearly destroying the entire formation. This was the best Russia had to offer, specifically designed to smash into NATO's most elite forces and win the day. But they were soundly defeated and nearly annihilated by Ukrainian forces operating Cold War tanks. As January came, the 1st Guards was reconstituted and once more thrown into combat in Luhansk, only to suffer yet a third bitter defeat. The fate of the 1st Guards is symbolic of the rest of the Russian military, which had experienced its first rout since World War II in the north of Ukraine. Morale was at a breaking point, defenses non-existent, and senior Russian leadership could barely coordinate its forces across Ukraine. Then the West stepped in to ensure that the Russian military would live to fight another day. Even as Ukraine begged its Western partners for vehicles, more anti-tank missiles and precision long-range weapons, its allies bickered over and delayed providing much-needed supplies for the Ukrainian military. Germany took center stage with its continual moving of the goalposts regarding Leopard tanks, until Britain gave a number of its Challenger tanks to break the ice. Even then, Germany refused to send tanks unless the US also sent tanks, despite American tanks taking much longer to get to Ukraine and train crews on and forcing crews to train for three different tanks now infinitely complicating the job of Ukrainian tankers. For its part, the US continued to refuse to send weapons like the Attackums and to purposefully modify missiles for its HIMARS so they could not be used to strike far enough to hit deep inside Russia itself. The procurement of armored infantry vehicles for Ukraine was a bit easier, but delayed until well after Ukraine's counteroffensive had culminated. At a moment that Ukraine was ready to break the Russian military, its partner sabotaged the death blow, fearful of Russian, quote, escalation. Forced to sit on its hands, the Ukrainian armed forces could do nothing but watch as the Russian military built the strongest fortifications seen in Europe since World War I. There was quite literally nothing Ukraine could do as it watched Russia create minefields miles deep, establishing defensive lines running as much as six deep in places and digging trenches at a rate of as much as a mile a day in places. The Ukrainian winter and the lack of Western support not only gave Russia the badly needed breathing room it required to reconstitute itself, but all the time it could ask for to prepare for an inevitable Ukrainian offensive in the spring. To make matters worse, the Western allies would once more bicker and politic over what equipment and who should deliver it even as spring approached, delaying the offensive even longer and giving Russia more time to prepare. When the offensive finally launched, despite all the signs it would be a difficult battle and Ukraine was still under-equipped, the West had the nerve to get annoyed when Ukraine's advances were measured in meters instead of kilometers. Ukrainian supporters began to question if it was all worth it to send more equipment, with Ukraine fatigue setting in, as news reports of minor gains all across the front were the only relief to dopamine-addicted observers of the war. The West wanted big wins, yet had done little to help Ukraine get them. Even worse, it had helped its enemy ensure big wins would be all but impossible. As the offensive ground into the fall, Western advisors began to pressure Ukraine to concentrate its forces into one or two major offensives in order to achieve a breakthrough. And a breakthrough would be critical before winter slowed the fighting even further and gave Russia yet another chance to consolidate. The West feared that a failure to deliver a decisive blow during this year's primary fighting season would only prolong the conflict allowing Russia to trade small bits of territory for time to undermine Western support for Ukraine. And yet, Ukraine refused to fight war on the West's terms, and it turns out it was likely the correct decision all along. As pointed out by the Institute for the Study of War, the West needed to take a seat and stop trying to drive the war. 
Ukraine rejected Western advice to concentrate its forces into at maximum two points of contact and instead opted to apply pressure all across the entire front. Normally, the Western way of war would be correct, but that's if you have all the benefits of fighting with a Western army and its vast combined arms capabilities. Ukraine doesn't have that luxury. It is critically short in armored vehicles, tanks, and most importantly, air defenses. In fact, the lack of frontline air defenses is what's reportedly dogged Ukrainian efforts to achieve a breakthrough. When the offensive began, Ukraine made multiple very promising advances that were repelled by Russia throwing its remaining attack helicopter fleet at them. It cost Russia dearly with the loss of many helicopters, but it was successful. Luckily for Ukraine, it had opted to conduct small-scale attacks rather than commit large amounts of valuable tanks and IFVs, which would have all been decimated by Russian air power. Instead, by spreading its forces around, Russia was denied the opportunity to strike a decisive blow against Ukraine's armed forces. It also had the benefit of pinning Russian forces down and preventing them from maneuvering. Rather than large assaults, Ukraine adapted a strategy of conducting largely dismounted, company-sized assaults across the front. These assaults lacked the ability to punch deep into enemy lines, but allowed Ukraine to be extremely flexible and pressure Russia across the entire front. This tactic has borne fruit, and Ukraine retains the initiative across almost the entire front. Russia's made only piecemeal advances in places, but it has largely been forced to sit behind its fortifications out of fear of allowing Ukrainian forces to exploit its weaknesses along the north-south defensive lines. In Bakhmut and the Zaporizhia Oblast, Ukraine has made its largest advances, despite some of Russia's strongest defenses. The Battle of Bakhmut did not end with a Wagner victory in late winter. It is, in fact, still raging. Ukraine has purposefully chosen to skirt the city and fight along its outskirts, knowing how disastrous urban fighting was for Russian forces during the winter. The city is strategically unimportant to both sides, but Russia's made it politically unacceptable to surrender it to Ukrainian forces. That's given Ukraine the ability to pin down huge numbers of Russian forces in the ongoing fighting, opening up opportunities for advance elsewhere, and all without repeating Russia's costly mistakes. The West trained several Ukrainian brigades in large-scale mechanized offensives, specifically for the purpose of concentrating power to achieve a breakthrough, yet the reality on the ground and the lack of Western support in the form of hardware made this untenable. However, here Ukraine proved that unlike Russia, it can adapt on the fly. The constant pressure all across the front has prevented Russia from creating a strategic reserve, and now that's costing Russia dearly as Ukraine punches through defenses in Zaporizhia at last. The news is grim, well, if you're a Russian at least. Utilizing a combination of probing attacks and precision strikes, Ukraine managed to exhaust Russian combat power in Zaporizhia, achieving the first breakthrough of Russian defensive lines in Robotina. This was crucial, but it wasn't time to celebrate yet. The Russian defenses here include three lines of defense, with the most robust being the first, and the two subsequently less so, but still quite formidable. These defenses include vast minefields, both in front and in between each line, an anti-tank ditch that makes it difficult for tanks to cross without engineering equipment, and dragon's teeth to impede or stop the movement altogether and leave them vulnerable to artillery, all sighted in and waiting to open fire. The entire time, not only are assault forces exposed to artillery, but also fire from defenders inside the trenches themselves. It's an unenviable task for anyone not enjoying the benefits of a major Western military. The first thing Ukraine did to secure a breakthrough was to cease utilizing its artillery to directly support its infantry assaults. This probably didn't go down well with the infantry who typically rely on artillery to pin down defenders as they approach. However, it was a worthy trade-off as Ukraine instead held its artillery in reserve until Russia fired first. Then using Western counter-battery radar, Ukrainian artillery fired back, destroying Russian guns. The situation got so bad that Russia began to complain over social media apps that their artillery was regularly being destroyed to precision counter-battery fire and that their military was unable to respond similarly. However, once the first and toughest defensive line was broken, Ukraine did the unexpected. Instead of punching straight through to the second line, they instead turned northeast and ran parallel to it. At Verbova, they struck the second line of defense, where Russia expected it least. Geolocated footage confirmed that here too the Ukrainians broke through the Russian defenses, with Ukrainian vehicles and infantry confirmed to be operating behind the second line of defense. Currently, the situation in Verbova remains unclear, with Russia not addressing a claim by a source affiliated with the Russian airborne forces that Ukraine had taken half of the city by September 24th. The fact that the tactical picture is so unclear, however, is good news for Ukraine, as it means the fighting is mobile and fluid 
as opposed to another largely static, grinding battle against fixed defenses. What we do know is that Ukrainian forces are now behind an estimated regiment's worth of Russia's elite paratroopers, dispatched there from the north of the country to bolster the sagging defensive lines. This has prompted many affiliated with the paratroopers in question, including multiple Russian military bloggers, to sound the alarm that this entire unit could end up destroyed as it's being encircled, with Ukrainian forces in the front and behind them. As of September 26, however, there is no indication that Russia has ordered the unit in question to retreat or that it's launched any sort of counterattack to open a pathway to them. This is likely because Russia simply does not have the capability to launch a counterattack and possibly because either the airborne forces are being sacrificed to pin down the Ukrainian troops and slow their advance or because Putin has issued an order forbidding Russian forces from retreating. Famously, Stalin's refusal to allow Soviet forces to retreat resulted in catastrophic losses but took most of the wind out of the German army's sails. We know that there's an estimated three Russian divisions fighting in the current salient, but what's unknown is if Russia has the strategic reserves required to prevent Ukraine from cracking the third line of defense. While it wouldn't be smooth sailing from here if Ukraine did break the third line, it would eliminate the most formidable obstacle preventing a major Ukrainian breakthrough which would inflict a catastrophic defeat on Russian forces. Ukraine has several armored brigades, a lot equipped with Western tanks, in reserve in the salient. These forces are awaiting the opportunity to widen the hole punched through by the infantry and break out of the infamously strong Russian defensive lines. If that were to happen, Russian forces would find themselves encircled and victim to their own defenses, which really only work if the enemy is attacking from the front. More importantly, it opens up the road to Tokmak, south of the current breakthroughs, which is a hugely important logistics hub for Russian forces in the region. The taking of Tokmak would bring Ukraine extremely close to completely severing Russian forces in Ukraine down the middle, trapping many of them in the south with their backs up against the Crimean Peninsula. And this is a scenario Ukraine has been planning for and is more than ready to exploit. In order to deny Russia the ability to simply retreat into Crimea, which would be very difficult for Ukraine to take. Ukraine started a campaign against the peninsula meant at denying its strategic use to Russia. It began with the use of special forces to infiltrate Crimea and destroy Russia's vaunted S-400 air defense systems. As of September 26, Russia has lost three out of five S-400 batteries in Crimea, effectively punching a massive hole in regional air defenses. This in turn has been thoroughly exploited by Ukraine, which has launched daily attacks against Russian forces in the peninsula. Famously, the most recent major strike against the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol ended with the purported death of the fleet's commander, along with dozens of Russian officers. Russia's refuted these claims, but the nation has little to no credibility left. Previous attacks destroyed a Russian submarine in a landing ship, with a recent revelation that both had nearly full crews on board who were largely lost in the attacks, and have prompted many to speculate that Russia's Black Sea Fleet will soon be forced to retreat if, in fact, it hasn't already begun to do so due to a lack of air defense coverage. What we do know is that the Russian Black Sea Fleet is basically an ineffective combat force at this point, and Ukraine has completely flouted the Russian grain export ban by starting the regular shipment of grain out of Odessa. Merchant vessels have begun to make the trip to Odessa once more, with Russian ships unable to enforce Putin's grain blockade. Ukraine has won the Battle of the Black Sea, and in doing so opened up its army for winning the battle for Crimea. The retreat of the Black Sea Fleet will also mean a significant drop in Russia's ability to launch long-range strikes into Ukraine. Black Sea Fleet vessels have been forced to remain close to port for their own safety for months now, but they were still used as mobile missile launching platforms. Their retreat will put much of Ukraine out of reach of their missiles now, forcing Russia to rely on an air force that faces increasing problems and soon the threat of the Ukrainian F-16s and modern long-range air-to-air missiles. There are many indications that Ukraine is about to achieve the breakthrough long hoped for. However, many warn that the fighting season could once more come to a close. Ukrainian leadership seems unwilling to repeat the mistakes of last year, though, and indeed has expressed that it will look to continue large-scale offensive operations even during the winter months. To do this, though, they need increased Western support, not in piecemeal packages, as has been the norm but in large, substantial, and ongoing commitments of hardware. If Ukraine loses the war for its independence, it won't be because Ukraine failed. It'll be because the West did. Now go check out how this war could evolve with what if Belarus joins forces with Russia against Ukraine, or click this other video instead.